education in prosthetics is not only bolts and nuts, but an understanding of what is practical, but most what is going to be useful to make that patient independent. I am Jerome Kessler. I was a practicing prosthetist and orthotist for about 30 years. When I was a little kid, I was at summer camp. My father drove up from New Jersey and we went to, took us to Boston. And there he delivered a pair of arms, prosthetics. And the little boy cried. What's the matter? It's a herd, what? I thought they were going to be fletched. That was my first experience in prosthetics. My facilities started when my father thought that prosthetics might be a key to my desires. My desires was to have something to do with medicine and the mechanics or the hands-on effort that is required. He suggested that I go into prosthetics. He always felt that although you do good, there is something better. Going back to 19, late 1930s, he was instrumental in the formation of the American Board for Certification, meaning that the quality of the prostheses that were made at that time, basically out of wood, was not good enough. He went to Germany to the Oscar Lehenheim Hospital in Berlin to learn a technique which would enhance the human body to activate a prosthesis. This was called cineplasty. He won the gold medal for that, and I believe it was 1936 or 38 at the American Orthopedic Society. This technique he felt was necessary so that there would be what we call tactile sensation in that the rather than gross motions of the shoulders to activate opening and closing a hand, that the original muscles that activate your hand closing can be more natural. It even proven to be so successful that he wrote a book called Cineplasty. To anybody who thought this is a crazy idea, we have films of a man by the name of Ray Lizer, who lost both arms below the elbow, playing 
The Hungarian Rhapsody on the piano. This was because of his demands for excellence. He believed that nobody knows it all, rightly so. And so he said, how about your training all around? He was the head of the amputee center at Mare Island during World War II. I trained there. I learned that there is no one unit that is good for everybody. An example was that the hooks or terminal devices that were dev provided to the sailors and Marines did not supply the infinite mechanics of what they wanted. And so they took these hooks, went down to the machine shop, and reworked them to provide the shape of hook that was necessary. A mechanic is not a farmer. A farmer is not a letter writer. And so each of these had to be designed. And the ingenuity that they provided was the establishment of training. I had the occasion of going to Europe and training at Queen Mary's Hospital for the Limbness in Roehampton, England. That factory, or that Ministry of Pension Center, comprised of not one firm, but several firms, and was the largest in the world until, and I think I'm right, the Russians came and saw it and built three of these facilities in Russia. Being such a large firm offered the experience of multiple type of injuries. One of them, which is way off base, if you will, was called rotoplasty. There were only maybe a half a dozen of these injuries or congenital anomalies, but the experience of how to fit such a oddball, if you will, injury or congenital anomalies was what my father was looking for in my training. It so happened, I believe it was around 1951-52, I was in Munster, Germany. This was the center for what was then a devastating injury or occurrence in Germany as well as the rest of the world. It was the taking of a drug called Contragon, which contained thalidomide. Professor Kuhn, as well as the ministry at this center, 
where I witnessed or served, saw thousands of cases of congenital anomalies. This little mind was taken in the first trimester of pregnancy, which caused this. It was devastating. On my next road trip, I was on the train. On the train in our compartment was a Belgium, Frenchman, Englishman. And I said, I have just come from Munster, where I have seen these thousands, not hundreds, but thousands of children with these anomalies. And they all agreed, it's true. I couldn't believe it. On my return to the States, after well, about a year and a half in Europe, I told my father. He said, then let's do something about it. And they started the children's amputee seminars twice a year. We didn't see 10. We didn't see 20. We saw close to 50 children who were born without arms, without legs, partial arm, partial legs. Within six months of my return, there was a rehabilitation seminar and exhibit in New York City. We had photographs of these children. They couldn't believe it, but it was true. Some of the children were bright, were beautiful, and they had to be trained two ways. First, physically. Second, mentally. But of extreme importance was the education that they received by other parents and that they were an integral part of what rehabilitation is. My part was to devise some type of prosthetic device that would enhance, not only enhance their life, but make their life practical. I believe the very first person was a little boy named Freddie Thomason. Freddie had no arms. Picture, if you will, a child. I think Freddie was about three when I saw him. Sitting on the table, no arms. OK. Well, how did he balance himself? He had no legs. They were hip disarticulations. So all you had was a body and a head. So the very first thing we had to do, how to get him for training balance. We made what we call stubbies. These were buckets, if you will, that went around his hip. They were attached to very short plastic 
tubes. At the distal end of those tubes was a small platform. The platform, however, was backward, like duck feet. Duck feet are out like this. Not so with the stubbies or duck feet. They were back. Why? Because we learned from the therapists that in balancing, they don't want to go over backwards. It's fine to go forward, but not balance. And so a progression of lengthen these stubbies were instituted. For his arms, I really don't remember. But another boy with hip disarticulations, Larry Kepner from Pennsylvania, he not only did well with the stubbies, that we gradually increased them so that he was tall enough that he played, I don't remember the exact instrument, in his high school band. Sometimes it is not feasible to make limbs for them like that. We have made a pang. Made a pang had what we call focomelia, meaning that the hands were coming out of her shoulders. She had rudimentary feet and short thighs. What do you do? You don't make limbs for them. You don't take those feet away because those feet are hands. So that made a pang could feed herself with her feet. For her arms, we made prosthetics devices so that the fingers of these hands would work the controls of the elbow, of the wrist, and of the terminal device. It's a combination of different things. Prosthetically, we had to devise, not us, but everybody, special terminal devices. This was the, what they call a wafer hook. Instead of a prong, it was a round disc so that it was like fingers. Not spikes, but fingers. These were some of the things that were developed. With the invention or discovery, and mostly the Germans in Munster, they had um, forgot the name, myoelectric. Myoelectric prosthetics was that there is an electrical impulse of the remaining or residual amputated side, which when thought to activate, created an impulse to a terminal device so that if I thought, hey, I want these muscles to close that hand, it would do so. 
These are some of the more recent developments. We call it the bionic arm. This is the electrodes that were in it, along with special fitting techniques. These were done over years. Professor uh, in Germany were instrumental in this. Development of prosthetics in California. Hosmer, Dorrance, Rear Elastic. These were new developments. The original arms were Fitch arm. These were metal. And they were used at Mirror Island until the development of new techniques. We have Hanky Mouse out of Ohio, which created and started new needs. Hosmer in California, a technique of transfer jigs. Transfer jigs were wonderful. And when I was in Copenhagen, a Mr. Stockholm used the expression, we use this to try and prevent or create idiot proof so that the technicians that were transferring a socket to the leg didn't make mistakes. I had a wonderful teacher, not so much in the technical side, but in the practical side. My father was, I believe, in Stockholm, Sweden, at a conference. And I said, Pop, I found the girl I want to marry. He said, for God's sakes, don't do anything till I get there. When he met Dory, he said, Jerry, if you don't marry her, I will. We lived in rehabilitation on the practical side by my marrying Dory. She taught me first because she was a perfectionist like my father. She taught Robin how to sew, Robin, my daughter. And Robin was very proud, and she showed the, the garment to my wife. And Dory looked at it and she said, Robin, is that the best you can do? With tears in her eyes, Robin took the garment, redid it, and showed it to Dory. And Dory said, now isn't that better? It's a way of life. It's a way of understanding. And I get on my bag bandwagon and say, fine. I have taken just as many courses, specialty courses, in prosthetics. And I try to adhere to my father's philosophy. It can be made of diamonds and rubies and all the precious gems in the world. But if it doesn't fit, it is worth nothing. Dory was a difficult case. 
and it took me a long time to understand what she wanted in her above knee limb. It is this understanding that is crucial on the part of the prostatist. It is not taking something off the shelf and giving you, and it's, quote, adequate. It is their life, and it is important that the education, other than the mechanical part, that the prostitutes today understands. Years ago, I went to a community college to learn what assessment means. You don't give a hybrid type of leg to a patient with arteriosclerosis or diabetic and had to have their a bionic unit. You give them something that is practical. We read today in the paper about the Special Olympics. We read that this spring type prosthesis for the track men is great. It is the most practical thing at today's day for him. But you can't give it to my wife. She wouldn't know what to do with it. And so whatever the prescription for a patient it must be analyzed by the physical therapist, the occupational therapist, the medical, the psychological. What are you going to do with it? If I gave you a PFFD, which is a proximal femoral focal deficiency type like, what good of it if you are an arm patient? There has to be a very strong practical use. All right? I've said what I've said that education in prosthetics is not only bolts and nuts, but an understanding of what is practical, but most what is going to be useful to make that patient independent, whether you use a satch foot on them, a multi-action, etc., whether the knee that you use is a hybrid, is a single axis, is a polycentric. You must determine ahead of time of the whole picture to fit not only the residual limb, but the person, their life, their personality. that the education also be to all people, that people are people. You have to fit the total person with what is practical and what is desirable of the patient. It's not a one-way street. You must offer them a category. Okay, 
This is what is available. But that's not practical for you. This is. Well, I want to do this. Well, fine, go ahead. We can do it. You lose an arm. You lose a leg. You have a heart transplant. That that handicapped the person. No. It has made them stronger because they have overcome that handicap. I love sports. And I said to my wife, well, how would you like to learn how to ski? She thought I was nuts. Sports medicine has taught us that the human body can do a multiple of things that we never thought possible. Sports medicine was one of the key activities at Stoke Mandeville in England, where they taught them all kinds of sports. Because everybody does sports. You don't have to be two-legged, two-armed to play tennis. Donald Kerr was a big advocate of that. And he was a below-knee amputee. When I was in Europe, I witnessed racing in sleds by amputees. But when I broached the subject to my wife, who was an above knee amputee, she said, Jerry, I've only got one leg to left. Let it be. But she compensated that in many different ways. She was an artist. She was knitter. She sewed dresses, made dresses for our daughter. Innately, any amputee will excel in something. What it is, who knows? But they will excel. And so their handicap is not being handicapped because they have other qualities that will compensate for that. The foundation, through its multiple activities and programs, can do the one thing that my father said, to make a tax pay out of a tax consumer. Those simple words have many interpretations, but it is true. I try to think of many of the activities that are performed by the human being. All of them can be supplemented, rather, by doing it a different way. And that the foundation, through education, can be an integral part of life. Our contribution 
is an understanding that all men are created equal, regardless or in spite of their handicap.